We're sorry we have to cut the music off, guys, but we're happy to be here with you. Thanks for turning out to this month's Grass Community Call. This project called Grass tends to move at a breakneck pace. Uh, there are many, many things that happen in any given month. Uh, it's kind of hard to keep track of uh, how much goes on at any given time. So we like taking these opportunities to share uh, to share it with you guys and keep you updated on what we've been up to. For today, what we'll be talking about. First, we're going to give you an update on recent growth in the network, some of the statistics on uh, what Grass has seen in terms of our user base. Then, uh, because our user base has expanded as quickly as it has, I think there's going to be a lot of people in here who are new, who weren't here for the last call, and maybe don't know as much about Grass as some of the rest of us do. So, the founders are going to do a quick recap, describing the basics of Grass and saying what it is and what we do. After that, we'll explain our mission and why we think this work is so important. You'll get some product updates on the future of Grass and some of the new uh, some of the new developments going on with the product. Then we'll do a question and answer period, uh, where some of the questions that you, the community, have asked us, will uh, will give you responses to those. And finally, our latest team member Donna will give you some details about an upcoming contest in which you can win exclusive Grass merchandise. Remember, Grass isn't just a network; it's a lifestyle. So this merch will come in handy in your daily life. But first of all, let's uh, let's kick it off with intros. I'll uh, pass it off to the founders, and you guys can uh, see who you are and what you do. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Andre. I'm one of the three co-founders of Grass, um, and I'll hand it off to Gordy and Michael. Thanks. Hey Andre. guys. Oh, oh go, go ahead, ahead Michael, please. <laughs> uh, yeah, Michael here. I lead the engineering team. Um, pass it off to Gordy here. Hey, hey everyone. Um, my name is Gordy. I lead everything on the growth and operation side of wind and grass. Awesome. I can go. I'm Contento. Uh, I'm the head of marketing at uh, grass. Thanks, guys. We also wanted to introduce the newest member of the grass core team, Donna Goldberg. Some of you may know her from her very active contributions in the Telegram, the Discord, and on Twitter. So we wanted to give her a moment to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Donna. I've just come on as head of community and wanted to take a moment to say how excited I am to be working with the team. Um, you know, before working with grass, I had assumed AI was a completely impenetrable field for regular people. And I didn't think there was a way for me to influence its future, but this is what GRASS disproves. And what we disprove is that with GRASS, not only are each and every one of us contributing to a safer and more equitable future, but we are the future. So I just really like to thank the community for bringing me in and congratulate you all for being on this journey. Thanks, Donna. I think we all feel that way. It's nice to see such positive, uh, such a positive response in the chat. I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad you guys have welcomed her as warmly as we have. So we wanted to give you an update on what's been going on in the grass ecosystem, the grass network, for the past month. March has been our biggest month ever. It's hard to wrap your head around, to be honest. Uh, we now have 1.8 million users on the grass network. 1.8 million people running nodes on grass. On one weekend in the month of March, 250,000 people joined the network. You have to take a step back and think about what that actually means. You hear numbers like 250,000, it's just an abstraction. Think about how many times in your life have you been in the same place as 250,000 people? 44 states in America, their capital cities don't have a population of 250,000 people. In one weekend, a city that big joined the grass network. This is growing at a absolutely rapid pace. And we're excited about what we'll be able to achieve with a growing user base uh, with some of the product developments that we have coming up. So with those uh, 250,000 people newly on board, we wanted to give the founders an opportunity to explain what is Grass for some of the people who are new, for some of the people who might not know uh, the background like the rest of us. So uh, Gordy, Andre, or Chris, if one of you wants to, uh, wants to give people a Grass 101 and talk about Maybe how uh, how the project started and what it does. Yeah, uh, happy to take this. Um, so as many of you here know, there's two inputs for AI. Uh, you've got data and compute. Grass is currently exclusively focused on the former, uh, as access to data is becoming a moat in the development of new and differentiated AI models. 
Um, it's hard to find an up-to-date training corpus and even more difficult to find one that isn't significantly skewed towards a Western bias. Uh, as companies that host mounds of public web data begin realizing the value of their data, they're, be, they're making their APIs unaffordable while they wait for a sufficient level of price discovery. Uh, Reddit's a great example of this, uh, so is WordPress. If you try scraping lots of websites yourself with data center infrastructure, there's, a, there's actually a great chance you'll be rate limited or honeypotted. And in order to help mitigate some of these issues, existing web scraping solutions have been turned into unethical means of acquiring this data. Most often, this involves sneaking SDKs into free consumer apps, allowing them to scrape the web with residential networks without compensating the users hosting these networks. Um, and this is where Grass comes in. It's a network of almost 2 million nodes now that are actively scraping and crawling the web. Um, doing, it, doing things this way actually gives us two competitive advantages. The first one is parallelization, as the workload can be distributed across uh, millions of edge nodes. And secondly, grass nodes are indistinguishable from real residential traffic, as they're hosted on real user devices on real residential networks. Um, and I guess most importantly, the internet isn't really the place it was 20 years ago. And we actually set out with the vision to build this because we hate what it's become. Right now, there's only a handful of companies in the world with the ability to access the internet at scale and build the best AI models. They're hoarding the data through various means, gatekeeping, honeypotting, data poisoning. Um, and as they continue to make the internet inaccessible for programmatic access, the average user increasingly becomes collateral damage. Their resources are being abused by tech giants and there's very little to no upside. Part of our mission isn't just to empower AI developers who are resource constrained and competing with these tech giants, but also to give the average internet user the ability to take back a little bit of control uh, and compensating them fairly and giving them some exposure to the upside of AI development. So one of the features we're building into the network, which is enabled by crypto, is actually data provenance. Now, if you think about the direction in which LLMs are progressing, it's really easy and kind of scary to draw parallels to how search engines operate. There will be an ever-increasing incentive for bad actors to retro retroactively poison scrape data sets and introduce some levels of bias, which is really similar to SEO tactics that are employed by companies trying to amplify their reach on search engines. This is actually pretty terrifying in the case of LLMs because the impact of a 1% or 2% bias for a computer program that that can pass the Turing test um, at scale could have a global impact, uh, not just on the economy, but on things like political elections and wars. Um, we're building grass, not just because we think it's a great idea for a crypto protocol, which it is, uh, but actually because we just don't want to live in a world in which it doesn't exist. Thanks, Andre. So if grass is a network of almost 2 million people who run nodes so that data can be scraped off of the internet and used to train AI models, then why is it so important that we're doing this? One of the things that we think is really important to communicate to you guys on this call is why we're a mission-driven company and what our actual values are and why we don't just think this is a great opportunity in crypto, why we think it's literally important for the world. So two of the things that we see going on in the internet these days is that the development of AI is being almost entirely monopolized by the same big tech companies who kind of monopolized the development of the internet over the past 20 years. If you look at who's really like a player in the AI game today, the biggest names are like Facebook, Apple, Google, and OpenAI, who's just, it's representatives of those different companies. So one of the dangers of AI being monopolized by these oligarchs who are in control of everything is that it concentrates wealth and power in the hands of a very tiny number of people. And that disempowers ordinary people like us and like you. The two ways that we see this taking form are one, all of the revenue, all of the value that comes from AI, all of the value that's created by AI gets captured by a tiny number of companies. One of the things that we're trying is create a way to carry people to and contribute to the development of AI in a way that captures some of that value. At the moment, what we're focusing on is that training data component. If we can be involved, all of us collectively, in the acquisition and distribution of AI training data, that means that all of us can capture some of that value 
that comes from the development of AI that would otherwise just go straight to those big tech companies. The other thing that we think is so important is that like you might have seen in the news repeatedly over the past couple of weeks, when a small number of companies has an enormous amount of control over a product like AI, they can cook their own biases into those products. So you start seeing things like biased results from ChatGPT or Google Gemini, where you ask it a question and it gives you an answer that clearly reflects the bias of this tiny number of people. The only way they can actually do that is by selectively choosing training data that gives the answers they want it to give. We don't have any way, we don't have any visibility into whether or not they're doing that because as of right now, and we need to say this as blatantly as we can, there is no way in existence for any contemporary way of sourcing AI training data to verify the origin of where the data came from. That's why the latest thing that GRASS has been working on, like Andre said, is data provenance, a system for verifying the origin of data sets. So in the future, when you use an AI model, when you interact with an LLM, you'll be able to verify where the training data came from. And more importantly, the developers who create the AI models, they can verify where the training data came from so they can avoid that data being poisoned. These are things that we're working on right now with the development of the GRASS layer two, which is far and away the biggest thing that has ever happened with GRASS. We go into a little more detail about that. I'm gonna pass it off to Gordy, Chris, and Dre again, and they'll tell you a little bit more about what the layer two is and how it's gonna help us achieve those goals and prevent AI from falling into the hands of a tiny number of people that frankly, we don't think any of us can trust. Yeah, yeah, I, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, first of all, why did we build a layer two? Um, the network's grown tremendously over the last couple of months. Uh, traffic has increased significantly. And there was one day I remember seeing the number of transactions going through the network top a million per second. Um, I think it was at that point we realized there was no way we could settle this on Solana, which was the original plan. Uh, essentially, what we needed to do was roll up as many of these transactions as possible, um, create sessions, representations of these, create representations of these sessions that run through the network, and then settle those specific sessions on Solana. Um, I guess that helps us with you know a couple of things. Like one, it reduces the cost significantly of using the network. Um, we don't want, I guess, a lot of the Web three components to impede on the cost of using this network for a bunch of the Web2 customers that will be onboarded. Um, and two, it, it'll, it'll be faster, right? Like um, by reducing dependencies on having to settle every transaction on Solana, we can continue to run the network independent of how the Solana chain functions. Um, and why we ended up picking the Solana was that because it's fast and cheap. So that's kind of the short end of the story there. Um, having this layer two helps us accomplish two things. Like first, it'll allow us to compensate all the users on the network. So whatever traffic uh, and gas fees paid through this network, we can distribute back to the end user, which are you guys in this case, the end nodes. Uh, and two, we can create data provenance and lineage for everything that runs this network. So from the moment that the data was scraped to the moment that it's published through the network, um, we create a hash representation of this data and publish that proof on chain for anybody to verify um, as it continues to use the data that came through this network. Um, that's kind of like a brief overview of, you know, how this layer two came to be. Beautiful guys. Thanks for that, Michael. And now we're going to move on to some questions and answers. A few days ago, we asked the community to provide us with any questions that they might have about the future of grass. And we selected a handful of them that we think are important. And we'll give you some insight into where we're going from here. So I'll ask. But the three co-founders can just chime in whatever they give. So the first is, what are the steps that we're taking to monitor and address abusive activity on the network? Yeah. Um, so uh, obviously, as we've grown our network to 1.8 million users, there's another 7.5 million uh, fake accounts that are eventually going to be zeroed out. Uh, we're taking a lot of different measures to cut to cache these, it's actually a lot easier than people think. Um, 
anything from using graph ml to find fake referral trees to monitoring certain patterns in networks actually makes it very simple to, to cache these within like 99% accuracy. Um, that being said, I'll, I'll just take this opportunity to advise anyone against using products like Whales Market, especially in the uh, context of grass, uh, because of you know because of the measures that we're taking to uh, uh, to, to stop a lot of these uh, civil accounts. Thank you, Andre. Oh, this is a good one. I've seen a couple of people ask this in the chat today, actually. Can we elaborate on the data labeling section of the dashboard? Yeah. Um, so to date, participation in Grass is actually super passive. All you have to do is add an extension or download the Saga app and start referring people. One thing we noticed is that you know our community is great. Everyone's super active. Um, and we we recognized, you know, that there's an opportunity to give everyone an even more active way of participating, uh, contributing to AI models and just using the application. Um, and not, not only did we you know, notice this, but we've also received a ton of inbound demand from fairly large AI foundations asking us, hey, you guys have a pretty large user base. Everyone seems fairly um, data adjacent or, or, or interested in AI data. What if we gave you tons of things like images or example prompts and responses uh, for people to go in and actually, you know, start labeling these data sets? Uh, this is super important, actually, when you're training AI models on synthetic data or, or even aligning an AI model in, for that matter, because when you feed synthetic data, synthetic data back into an LLM, there's a tendency for error to just start propagating. Uh, unless there's a certain level of human feedback uh, for for that for that reinforcement learning, so soon on the grass dashboard, you'll actually be able to start you know clicking on images and labeling them, um, or evaluating prompt responses and things like that. Uh, one of the really exciting things about our user base is that it's actually global, so this will probably be available in many different languages, not just in English. That is exciting. As we said earlier, I think one of the things that we're trying to do in the long term is just look for more and more ways that we can get ordinary people involved at different levels of the AI development pipeline. So that just seems like one more way to me that people can get involved besides just passively running a node. The last as we have a very, very significant um, infrastructure upgrade. We migrated to a new backend infrastructure that can take significantly more load than the one we were using before. So we now have 1.8 million users. The question is, with this new infrastructure in place, what is a rough ballpark of the number of users that we could conceivably scale to in the future? Yep, um, I could take this one. So uh, before this infrastructure upgrade, we had about 2 million active connections at any given moment. Um, I think that was causing a lot of strain on the back end. Uh, a couple of days after the infrastructure upgrade, that number jumped to nine. So I think, and at this moment, it, it, it continues to scale horizontally without any issues. Um, at this, basically with this new design, we can keep going horizontally. Um, 100 million should not be a problem. Um, but you know, as we hit those numbers, we'll have to you know, reassess and upgrade as needed. But um, this new design should be a lot more robust uh, and free of bugs than what was previously there. Um, some of you might have noticed, you know, points are currently backlogged in terms of calculations. Uh, we're adding a fix to that as we speak. Um, the missing points for the 27th, that was the day of the migration. Uh, we'll have something to compensate users for that have been around, you know, since then and see a big missing bar on the day of the 27th. Um, yeah. 100 million should not be a problem. We're not telling you guys to meme it, but if you want to meme it, 100 million should not be a problem. So I think that's all we have to tell you for today, except for one last thing. Donna is going to announce the details of our upcoming Touch Grass Challenge, where you can participate on social media for a chance to win exclusive grass merchandise. She's going to do that on a separate call, which will begin at noon on this exact stage. So we're going to cut to an intermission now. We want to thank all of you guys for coming out and listening. And stick around because at 12 o'clock Eastern time, you're going to hear some details about how you can win grass merch. Thanks, everybody.
Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye, guys. I'll see you at noon.